We are live. It's Dr. J here in the house with Evan Brand. Really excited about today's topic. We've been talking about binders a little bit here recently, and we're going to be going into the top binders to help and improve mold toxicity and to help kind of help your body get rid of mold in a safe, uh, meaningful way. Evan, how are we doing today, man? Hey, doing well. Always excited to dive in with you here. Let's just drop the bomb right out of the gate here. Mold is epidemic. I mean, you saw several podcasts you and I've done together on mold. I got exposed. My levels of okra toxin were off the chart. I had a ton of symptoms. We took the family and lived in a hotel temporarily to escape until we could find a new plan. I had to get rid of a lot of clothes that were contaminated. I even tried doing some special laundry detergent we use and couldn't save some of my clothes. So I know firsthand that this can be a huge problem for people and it can be frightening because conventional doctors, which we hear this all the time during consults, they just don't really have a clue about this. And if you go to the emergency room with dizziness and shortness of breath and blood pressure issues and hives and skin reactions and food sensitivities and all these other, what may to some people be crazy symptoms, you're just going to get like an anti-anxiety medication and you get sent home. And that's where people start to question their sanity. So I hope that we can provide some sanity today and then also provide some actions, you know, action strategies of how to get this crap out. 100%. So the first off is how do we eliminate mold from our body anyway? So we have a couple of, you know, reasonable means of detoxification. The big ones that we're pushing are going to be via bile slash stool because your liver and your gallbladder make bile, your gallbladder stores it and concentrates it. And then we excrete that one to help break down fat. Then some of that is going to be captured in the stool and eliminated via the stool. Some is going to be out the urine, right? And a lot of mold testing, if we're testing someone, we're going to be testing via mold in their uh, urine. So we're actually using urine as a way to assess mold excretion and mold level. So the gut, stool, and urine slash kidneys are going to be the biggest ways. We have some other ancillary ways we may be pushing and provoking, such as using sauna or infrared therapy, which we're using the skin and the sweat to kind of excrete some of these things. Obviously, if you're a pregnant mom, you may even be using breast milk. That's why it's important to, to really get yourself healthy. So we're limiting the baby's exposure to mold um, via breast milk. So those are kind of some of the big ways and means the body is going to eliminate mold. Now, first thing out of the gate, I'm not a huge fan of jumping on and going after mold right away unless we have some type of acute exposure or we know we're in an environment where mold is present, where we can visually see it. We have very abnormal high amounts of mold via testing. We know there was a major flood or some area and uh, we weren't able to remediate it. So typically I don't love to go after it right away, partly because healthy gut function is going to be one of the major ways that we detoxify from mold. So we know just based on the literature that gallbladder function, good bowel motility and good stool motility helps us eliminate a lot of mold. We know that because we're contracting our gallbladder. We're eliminating a lot of mold via bile synthesis and ejection and then having healthy BM. So just by having your gut on track, we're going to be eliminating lots of mold. And if we look at the different types of mold that we can chelate and or pull out of our body, probiotics have effects on detoxifying nearly all mold toxins. Probiotics, according to literature, help us detoxify aflatoxin, gliotoxin, uh, sterigomatocystin, um, zeralinone, eniatin B, and citronin. These are all different mold toxins, mycotoxins. Most of them are going to be eliminated with probiotics. Now, what does that mean? That means out of the gate, if you have healthy, the best way to detoxify mold is having good, healthy gut function and good, healthy bacterial balance. So if we have SIBO, bacterial overgrowth, gut infections that are throwing off healthy bacteria balance in our gut, that's going to be one of the major ways that we can chelate mold is having good, healthy bacteria balance and also having good, healthy biliary function and good healthy motility. So if we don't have enzyme, acid, bile salt production, we're probably going to be slower motility. If we don't have good bacteria balance with healthy good levels of bacteria to bad, we're probably not going to be able to chelate mold efficiently as well. So probiotics are like, I think the home run chelator that most people don't think of, right? We think of like clays and charcoal and, and, and medications like cholestyramine, but we forget about the probiotics and how good healthy gut function plays such a big role. 
Yeah, this is crazy because, you know, when I first got exposed, you and I were actively researching and looking into the literature on this. And it kind of felt a little overwhelming because it's like, well, crap, now we got to work all these other things into the protocol. But now with the more and more research coming out on these specific strains, like you mentioned probiotics, but we'll also talk about something that we sell and market as a probiotic, but technically is a beneficial yeast, Saccharomyces. This has been shown to bind to aflatoxin, also ochratoxin and zearlanone and gliotoxin. So this is amazing because you and I have been using Saccharomyces for years and now all of a sudden, here we are. We didn't even really know this. We've been detoxing mold the whole time as a side effect of doing these gut protocols with people. It's really beautiful. It, exactly. And this is why I tell people, if you go after the foundational systems in functional medicine and not necessarily worry about all the symptoms downstream, you're going to hit and help so many other areas of the body. And it's kind of like bowling, right? If you just focus on hitting that first pin square, you're going to knock down a lot of other pins in the second row, right? Same kind of thing with functional medicine. If you hit the foundational pins, right? Good digestion, good solid anti-inflammatory diet, good motility, good anti-inflammatory support, reasonably healthy, balanced adrenal, thyroid, female or male hormones. That plays such a major role on immune function, detoxification, elimination. It plays such a huge role. And you can miss the crazy nuanced mold protocol and still help people get better. Now, there's some people that are going to still need additional mold support outside of this, right? And of course, the more genetically uh, prone you are, right? There are certain people that have this kind of uh, gen these certain genetic markers that make them more mold sensitive, okay? And then of course, the levels of mold, being in a mold environment longer, living in that basement that's moldy without the dehumidifier and the sub pump, living in that um, damaged home, living in that flood damaged environment, these things, the leaky roof, chronically, it can definitely accumulate in your system. And even someone that's not that genetically sensitive, if those mold levels increase above and beyond for so long, you may eventually become sensitive. So we have to look at the environment and look at the levels and make sure we're trying to fix that environment first. If it's over the top, we got to really get that environment fixed. And that's why it's nice to be able to do mold testing that looks at your home first. And so we have some testing that we use, various labs that use plate testing that can be very helpful. We're going to put links down below for the specific tests that we use. So if you guys want to do some deeper testing, feel free to click the link down below. Evan, any comments on that? Yeah, I just wanted to hit back on the probiotics, one of the mechanisms, because I think this is pretty cool. And once again, this is just makes me feel better about the gut work we've been doing with people so many times, because like I said, we've been fixing things with mold, not even truly knowing it. So one of the mechanisms of some of these beneficial bacteria is that it actually upregulates glutathione S transferase. So here we are coming in now, we'll supplement glutathione, but you're actually increasing glutathione just by taking some of these beneficial strains. So that is just absolutely amazing. And it's funny because we focus so much on the binders in the conversation of detox. You hear so much talk about charcoal and sauna and all these more intense therapies. But in reality, that's kind of the icing on the cake, it sounds like. Now, for me, I still do take binders. I still do charcoals and clays and all of that. And I think it's totally beneficial. And if I take a hit, if I go to a moldy building and take a hit, the binders do help me reset. But I'm going to start working in just some high-dose probiotics and see. And I'll report back and see what if I take a big hit and instead of a binder, or maybe I do both. Maybe I hit binder and probiotic and see if I get greater relief. That's going to be an interesting experiment. Totally. Now, if you're out there and you're like, man, probiotics make me feel worse, or if you have kind of like headaches or mood issues or more cognitive issues, or you just have more digestive issues, there's a good chance that you have SIBO, dysbiosis, bacterial overgrowth, maybe other types of gut issues. And those are going to have to be looked at because if you have those types of imbalances, odds are there's a skew in the ratio of bad bacteria to good bacteria in the gut. And if we know there's more bad and less good that's naturally present, then it's going to be harder to have good, healthy mold detoxification because we know how important those good beneficial bacteria are. So keep that in the back of your head. If you are someone that's like, man, Dr. J and Evan really talked about how all these mold toxins are super, um, you know, they get chelated out by probiotics, you know, bifidobacter, lactobacillus, saccharomyces. I can't take them. What do I do? Well, you got to look deeper. You got to reach out to a good functional medicine practitioner and really work on getting your gut dialed in. Work on the six R's before we touch probiotics, right? Remove the bad foods, replace the enzymes, acid, bile support, support 
the um, repairing of the gut lining and the hormones, then work on removing the dysbiotic bacteria and the infections. The fifth R is to re repopulate, re-inoculate good bacteria pre and probiotics. That comes fifth, not first. Most people want to put that in first. So we guess you got to do things in the right order. And of course, the six R is to retest. Yeah, let's talk about pooping too, because you're mentioning all these steps with the gut. If people are coming straight into detox, you mentioned you don't like to come at it right away. Part of the reason is because if people are constipated, you can't really start binding these toxins. Binding sounds really attractive. It sounds like, oh, you've grabbed onto the toxin, but really this is not a super tight bond. Cholestyramine is a very tight bond. It's very strong, but that's a prescription binder. And there are a couple of papers on mitochondrial damage happening. So I'm not a huge fan of cholestyramine out of the gate for people if they already have chronic fatigue. Now I'm not a pharmacist. I'm not a medical doctor. So if your doctor says cholestyramine is the best, fine, go for it. But for me, when I took cholestyramine, I do think it irritated my gut quite a bit. So I was kind of fixing one thing and then irritating another. I was pulling the mycotoxins out, but then my gut became more irritated and I had more sensitivities to certain foods. So looking back what I've done it again, I don't know. I may have just leaned more on some of the natural binders. It would have just took longer. I was just desperate to get better. 100%. And so I know with cholestyramine, people that are listening, the research shows this is going to be more helpful to the mycotoxins that are produced by the aspergillus and penicillium molds. And a lot of times, if I have it right, Evan, you would know maybe a little more than me, is the specific molds aren't necessarily the big immunological issue. It's more of the mycotoxins produced by the mold. Is that correct? Well, the bigger problem with the mold itself is just when you're colonized. So a lot of people will do on the oat, you'll see that they're not colonized, but they just have the mycotoxin. So the way I say it is you kind of have three situations. Step one, you could be a mold factory. Step two, you could be a mold reservoir, or technically you could be both. You could be a reservoir and a factory at the same time. That's when the actual mold is the problem. And then that's where the antifungals come in, in addition to the binders. So you're saying... So you're saying the aspergillus or penicillium molds can be produced by your internal microbiome because of different fungal overgrowth in your body? Totally. Yeah. If you've been exposed long enough or a big enough amount of it, or your immune system is weakened by other things, whether it's like you mentioned gut infections or Lyme or, or co-infections, if something's weakened you enough and that colony can take place, then you're in bigger trouble and just using the binders won't get you better because you haven't turned off the water hose essentially. You're still, so even if you're in a desert island situation, you're still colonized. So you're generating mycotoxins internally and binders are just gonna open the drain. They're not gonna stop the water pouring in the bucket. Got it. So that's where addressing the gut stuff really makes a big difference. Wiping out, using specific herbs to kind of clean down the fungal overgrowth and bacterial overgrowth make more of a difference. Of course, with molds, probably more on the fungal side, correct? Yeah. And that's the cool thing about what you and I do is we use a lot of herbs that are broad spectrum, right? So it's fun because we may come in and see this colonization problem, but we're also going to come in and simultaneously be working on the bacterial overgrowth and the parasites and maybe H. pylori in the mix too, and worms and, and gut inflammation. So I would say rarely are you just going to come in and just do the antifungals. We're probably going to see many more things going on. By the time you get to a fungal overgrowth, like if you see on the note test, you'll see the aspergillus growing. By the time you get to that point, there's probably also candida. There's probably also some SIBO stuff. There's potentially also parasite infections too. So to find just the colonization so far in all the testing I've looked at, it's pretty rare. You're, you're usually going to have three, four, five infections at the same time. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. I would just say out of the gates, think of the mold as like the seeds and think of the, the fruit that's, that's bared by the seeds is like the mycotoxins. And essentially you're saying you could have a whole bunch of seeds down there and not necessarily a lot of fruit being bared from those seeds, or you can just have a lot of the, the, the fruit and the vegetables, right? Those are like the mycotoxins that may not have a lot of the seeds there. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think of mycotoxins, I just call them mold farts because you could yes. go in a building yep. and you could be exposed to okra toxin in a, let's say your child goes to a moldy school or a moldy daycare, your child can be exposed to the penicillium and the aspergillus, but it might not get colonized. Your child might just come home and it only has the mold fart inside of them, AKA the okra toxin, the mycotoxin. So yeah. Yeah. And you can eliminate that and you can detoxify it. Some people, they may just be genetically sensitive and they have a harder time eliminating that, that mold fart out of their system. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. some people, they kind of question us like, well, why is this such a big deal? Molds everywhere, blah, blah, blah. So just, I just want to say just two things on that real quick. Number one is the, the buildings are much tighter than they used to be. So we don't have that natural leakage. I mean, you think of like an old 1800s farmhouse, you'll feel the draft coming in. 
and they use plaster yes. and other building materials. They didn't use paperback drywall like we use today. So the building materials have changed and the, uh, the homes are much tighter. So, I mean, you could have an old house in Kentucky from the 1800s built of plaster and it might have not been moldy or if it was built of concrete or something. But now you've got lumber and then you've got paperback drywall. You've got high humidity. You've got the moisture. People used to do clotheslines. My grandmother would hang her clothes. I remember as a kid, she had the big clothesline. Now you have a dryer in the home. You've got moisture coming from that. You've got your washing machine. You've got your dishwasher now where that thing is off gassing humidity. You've got showers and bathrooms. And we just build this moist envelope, which is a home. So that's why you and I, we, we have whole house dehumidifiers in our house. So that's really exactly. one important strategy. If you're like, okay, yep. I'm going to do the binders. Now what? Well, you've got to make sure your environment is an oasis. So it's the air purifiers. It's the dehumidifiers. It's the mold treatments that we do inside the home that really are the icing on the cake, or maybe not even the icing. It's the foundation. If you're yeah. getting exposed, you're wasting your time with these protocols. Yeah. And very interesting too. I saw a home uh, that was, I think, built in the 1800s. And one of the things they used for insulation in the home was uh, horsehair. So you had horsehair mixed with plaster all in the walls. And that was what they used for insulation. I wonder if, I would imagine hair probably wouldn't mold too much, um, but it was really interesting. And um, they couldn't even get Wi-Fi in the home because the horsehair was so insulating from Wi-Fi technology, you couldn't even pass through it. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Wow. Well, I know a lot of the camper vans, you know, people are taking vans and converting them into like travel things for the road. They're putting wool insulation in there because the wool can get moist and wet and it won't mold versus yes. if you're doing like a standard like cellulose or other type yes. of insulation that will create mold. So yeah, I mean, nature is smart. Nature's got it figured out. And that's probably why some of those homes that had the hair in it, you know, I imagine the horse hair is probably very similar in regards to the, uh, the lack of molding capacity. Yeah, there's just, it's not organic, right? I mean, some could argue, well, that's hair, that's natural, but it's not an organic material like paper. Like mold wants to eat paper, fungus wants to eat paper. That's just part of its the natural biological process. But hairs, totally, mold's not interested in eating that. And we talked about mold or fungus kind of colonizing. We have SIBO bacteria or candida, which is a common fungus species. All of these produce their own toxins, right? Mycotoxins are produced. Um, from candida as well. And these can create, whether it's acid aldehyde causing a drunk feeling or uh, making you feel drowsy and brain foggy and tired or affecting the mitochondria, or whether it's endotoxin produced by H. pylori or some kind of a bacterial overgrowth, whether it's citrobacter, Pre Prevotella, uh, Pseudomonas, right? Um, all these different types of bacteria, these things can affect obviously gut permeability, and when we affect gut permeability, we automatically have a negative effect on our immune system because the more permeable our gut is, the more undigested foods, the more these mycotoxins or endotoxins get in our bloodstream, they can make their way up to our brains and cross between the astrocytes, which are the blood brain barrier immune markers, immune cells. And once they're in their brain, they can create immune reactions and they can activate our microglial cells. And these can create brain fog issues, mood issues, um, maybe sleep issues. And of course, People have mold. One of the most common symptoms is this like disequilibrium, brain fog type of scenario. Is that one of the symptoms you notice the most frequently, Evan? Totally. Yeah. It's not fun, yeah. but I'm slowly recovering. And my oat test did show I had candida and my diet's clean. So I'm basically animal based plus some nuts and some berries here and there. And so people immediately think, oh, candida. Yeah, but I'm paleo or I'm AIP or whatever. There's no way I can have candida. And you made a great point that candida will actually uh, produce mycotoxins, specifically one called gliotoxin. And we can test for that via urine. Aspergillus mold also makes it. So if you see super high gliotoxin and you're super spacey, we know that that could be from a water damaged building, but it also could be from candida. But yeah. If you look on Dr. Shoemaker's website, surviving mold or Neil Nathan's book, toxic, those are great resources to look for symptoms. We put it on our intake form. Now that's how we justify testing it is we just have those symptoms on there and we just have people check it off on the form. And anytime we see more than three symptoms checked off in the last six months, we just immediately say, okay, we need to run for urinary mycotoxins. And I'll tell you, pretty much 9.9 .9 out of 10 times if they check, 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 and then we test the mycotoxins are there. And then that gives people the confidence that we're doing the appropriate binders and the appropriate protocol to address it. Yeah. And for me, a lot of times out of the gates, when I see a lot of these cognitive issues, I just wait and see and look at how much of the foundational things we're going to do improve it. So a lot of times just getting the diet cleaned up, getting digestion cleaned up, making sure we're eliminating 
uh, making sure the environment's pretty decent, right? There's nothing over in the environment. A lot of times, if we start to see movement on that, people are improving. I don't even jump into the mold stuff out of the gates. I'll only jump into it if there's a stronger history or things aren't moving in the right direction with some of these foundational things. Yeah, you and I are a little different in that just because now people are like seeking me out because they already know they've been exposed. Like, oh, yeah. Evan, I heard your story. It's like, oh, great. Now I got all these like moldy people coming out of the woodwork to come get yeah. me. Uh, so they already know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's definitely complicated things. Yeah, exactly. And if you're getting more people that are having these issues and already know it and already have done foundational things, then it makes sense to just kind of go into that next initial step for sure. I, I said yep, something I, earlier, I, but, but I didn't finish the thought on it, which was we were talking about pooping and we got into the SIBO and the CFO and the infections. And, and one thing we were talking about is the, the idea of binding being really attractive because it sounds like it's just going to grab onto the toxin and it's just like perfectly in a straight jacket essentially, but that's not actually how it works. And you can actually get worse using binders. And I did that one day in, in particular, I've had many days like this, but one where I took like eight capsules of charcoal because I was just ramping up slowly to see how I felt when I got up to eight. Oh my God, I was way worse. And the reason is the binder is a weak magnet, I think is the best way to look at it. And so the mycotoxin is attached to it, but it can still detach on its journey through your intestinal tract and reabsorb into the bloodstream, especially if you have gut irritation or leaky gut. So this goes back into what you're hitting on, which is you really got to do the gut work, get the gut somewhat optimized first, or maybe simultaneously optimize the gut. Because if you've got all these binders moving stuff through, but your gut's super leaky, or the second problem is you're constipated, you're not pooping, you're going to reabsorb a lot of this stuff and get worse. So if you've taken binders and you feel worse, those are two reasons why. Exactly. I mean, if you go, I think you can get these, like you see them at like the science museum when you're a kid, it's like a plate of iron filings. And then you put a magnet on top and you can see the, the iron filings kind of trailing the magnet. And obviously like the faster you go, you're going to see more of the iron filings kind of like falling off the tail end, right. And kind of getting left behind. Right. If you put that magnet in there and like, you just really go slow through the, the iron filing board, you keep a larger percent of those iron filings. So I kind of look at that as if we start using binders, the less we use, the less fall off we're going to have as well. Well, one, the less you're going to mobilize, right? And the, the less you mobilize, the less fall off as a percentage, right? And as a absolute amount. So if we're going to start with binders, we're going to start with a very, very small amount to mitigate the fall off percentage that is just going to happen. Because like Kevin said, there's a weak bond there. And so you can break some of it off. And of course, a lot of these binders could cause you to have slower motility. So if you're already on the fence with your gut and you start doing any binders at all and you notice your motility starts to slow down, got to be careful. We got to start either waiting, fixing the gut, maybe adding some natural motility support. We just have to be very careful. Binders causing slow motility is going to be a recipe to cause more mold die off issues. Yeah, for me, luckily, you know, I, I never had a problem pooping. My poops were always great. Even on cholestyramine, I never got constipated. That's like the biggest complaint of it. No, I was fine. So for me, I was lucky, but many people, they do get stopped up. So we will come in and use like magnesium can work great, like magnesium hydroxide or citrate. We'll use higher dose vitamin C. What else do you like to use to move the bowels? Well, we can use natural prokinetics, whether it's ginger, 5-HTP. A lot of times neurotransmitter 5-HTP issues can cause problems because that really helps with the gut as well. We can look at things like carnitine. We can look at a lot of different bitters that can be helpful. Um, not having enough acid or enzyme levels can easily cause slower motility. Obviously, a lot of sympathetic nervous system stress over adrenal stimulation can activate more of the sympathetic nervous system. That can slow down peristalsis and cause a lot of problems there because we need more parasympathetic nervous system stimulation. So all of those things can, can push us in that wrong direction. Yeah, this is fun stuff. I mean, this is like one of the smoking guns. I mean, it certainly was for me. And I hope people are encouraged by this. You can get better with this. It takes time. Timeline wise, two to three years is what I would say for most people with a major toxin load. I've seen it done in a year or so. But if you ask some of the medical docs that are treating mold, they'll say three to five year timeline. And I just want to make that clear because some people get frustrated. They'll say, hey, I'm, you know, six weeks into a protocol. And, you know, here's my results. And it's like, man, six weeks is just a drop in the bucket. So if you've been exposed to mold as a kid or your mother had placental transfer or you were breastfed and that was transferred or you grew up in a moldy house or had childhood exposure, you had exposure in your college dorm, then you had exposure in your office and your home. I mean, if you're talking 50, 60, 70 year old person reversing mold issues in two to three years, that's very fast. 
So I just want people to have realistic expectations with this. Yep. That obviously depends upon how long you've been accumulating these things for sure. And if you're so colonized, because yeah, if you're colonized yeah. too, you got to knock that out too, because let's say you got exposed 20 years ago, but now you're colonized. So you're just generating internal mycotoxins. That is also something I think is going to definitely increase your timeline. And your best way to look at that is going to be like an organic acid test where you're looking at some of those aspergillus, those type of mold, um, those mold critters. Is that correct? Yeah. There's like four or five markers on page one. I know you like to use uh, yeah. Genova, right? I, I use that test as well for some of these, you know, more mold potential people, or if we're looking at a lot more oxalates and things like that, that's a nice test to look at that. Yeah. So that one's good. And then the I'll great plains is good too. I mean, the page one on it's awesome. Cause they also have a marker for, I think it's tricarbolic. I'd have to look back, but they do have a, a marker now for fusarium, which is cool. Cause sometimes yeah. you'll see some people colonize for fusarium, which is another mold, but not aspergillus. A lot of times it's both though. If they're colonized, that means they were so weak or had so much exposure. Usually you'll see the, aspergillus and the fusarium. You can't see all mold, molds growing. Maybe the technology gets better in the next few years, but for now you can at least test the most common mold we see, which is aspergillus. Yep. hundred percent. So let's kind of go into all the different binders, right? We talked about cholestyramine. That's a medication um, that's going to help more of the okra toxin, right? The aspergillum penicillium molds. Um, charcoal is a common one. Uh, I like it. Charcoal is very prone to constipation. It's also, let's say, if you have, tend to be more sensitive in the colon area, whether it's hemorrhoids or fissures, it can be a little bit rough on people's colons on the way out. So I find if you tend to be more prone for hemorrhoids, that can be a problem. So keep an eye on charcoal. It's a good one. It's the cheap one. It's nice, you know, nice coconut shells, right? Uh, that's where they're getting a lot of the good charcoal from. And again, we like charcoal for primarily removing a couple of different types of um, molds, right? The big mold that we're going to see with charcoal, it's going to affect the trichothecenes, right? It's going to have some effect on um, ochratoxin as well. Those are going to be some of the big ones out of the gate with charcoal. Let's see, is there anything else that charcoal tends to be very helpful with? Yeah, okra and the trichothecenes. Anything else there, Evan? It may help with some pesticide or herbicide stuff too, right? I mean, we know charcoal is a pretty good broad spectrum, but it's not perfect in isolation. That's why you and I like to use blends a lot because we see people go yep. benefit to charcoal and then they just totally ignore the others. Exactly. So it's nice to have some broad spectrum there. Obviously, we have things like clays as well, which are, are really nice, tend to be a little bit more gentle coming out the colon. Again, very helpful for gliotoxin, okra toxin, uh, zeralinone. Those are a couple of different mold toxins that you're going to see more on the beneficial side. Um, in regards to clays. Also, it's going to be very helpful of aflatoxin as well. Aflat. I think aflat is going to what, be what you see more with the, um, the peanuts, right? Yeah, totally. So, yeah, more food based. Zero yeah, linone is going to be, uh, zero linone is going to come from Fusarium. Cattle. And that really screws cattle, up. cattle, right? Yeah. So the cattle, they, they'll they test high because they're eating like messed up corn. They'll, they'll eat messed nasty, up corn. Nasty corn. I've even heard Dave Asprey talking about putting zero linone in the cow's ears, they'll put them in their ears. And it, it causes them to accumulate more fat. And we know that mold toxins have a negative effect on thyroid. So I wonder if it's just lowering the thyroid enough where they're just becoming more fat accumulators versus burners. So that's an interesting uh, concept. Yeah, well, zeolinone is super, super estrogenic too. So maybe yep. it's just making them have high estrogen and then that creates yeah. the body fat. Yeah, I know Dave talked about that um, many years ago, but which is really interesting, putting it in a cow's ear like a pellet. That's crazy. It's bizarre. Well, I, yeah. I can confirm that the clays work amazing for zeolinone. We had a woman who had a lot of estrogen dominant symptoms. So we got her on the zeolite spray. Actually, we just tried to go isolation and see how it worked, man. It worked like a charm. We got the retest back and the zeolinone was gone and a lot of her estrogen dominant symptoms went away. So that That's was great. freaking amazing. It's great. Next we have glucomonin and different fibers. So fibers are going to be really helpful, whether it's like a modified citrus pectin Glucomonin is also another type of fiber that we use as a pre or probiotic. It can be helpful, but that's going to be helpful against aflatoxin, okra toxin, zeralinone, uh, modified citrus pectin is also shown to be great at binding up heavy metals, uh, lead, different things like that. Um, okra toxin, like I already mentioned, those are some of the big ones out of the gate. Anything else you want to comment there? Uh, yeah, before we forget to mention it, Calcium deglucarate is also really helpful. We do talk about that in regards to estrogen. You and I've done a podcast on like bacterial overgrowth, and we've talked about how high beta glucuronidase will basically cause you to recirculate hormones and toxins. So we will come in and use calcium deglucarate as part of a mold detox protocol, but it does help with other things too. Yep. I like that. Very cool. 
Um, next, chlorella. Chlorella is very good, um, really high in certain vitamins, A, C, and E, good source of fiber. Uh, helps with heavy metals as well. Been shown to be very helpful at mobilizing, not really mobilizing, but binding up to any mercury that's in your gut. So if you're dumping a whole bunch of mercury via your gallbladder uh, from your liver into your intestines, it does help bind that up, which is really, really good. Uh, very helpful at binding up different types of molds as well. The big ones are going to be the aflatoxin. That's going to be one you're going to see more in um, food products, peanuts, right? And then ocratoxin, which is a common one that you're going to see. Um, and that's going to be more like like water damage in the home for okra, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, aspergillus yeah. makes that. So, and then also you mentioned yep. uh, mobilization. So a lot of times we'll use combos. So we'll use like a chlorella and cilantro because cilantro will help mobilize. And that's the cool thing is you, you may create what what's called a mycotoxin detox protocol, but in reality, you're working on heavy metals, you're working on pesticide and herbicide. So it's really fun because you're killing so many birds with the same stones when it comes to these binders. So chlorella is amazing and we like to use micronized versions of it. So we can put links and show you what we want and what we would want you to use. Obviously at this point, may be good to consult a practitioner. You know, we're happy to help. Or if you have another practitioner guiding you through this, who's done this before, it's helpful because you do want to be able to approach these things in a smart way. And you want to know what to do if you do get a reaction, because like I said, I screwed myself up many times. The best way to learn is experience in the trenches and I'm in the trenches on my own mold recovery. And I tell you too much chlorella sounds like, Oh, just some chlorella. Whoa. That right. stuff is powerful. Yep. Exactly. Uh, next one, humic acid, right? We see humic acid or different fulvic minerals. A lot of different companies are recommending these and pushing these now, which are uh, helpful, right? Humic acid, fulvic minerals, they're very helpful because they are anti-inflammatory, which is really good. I think they tend to not push constipation as much, right? You can kind of take them and they're not going to slow down your motility as much. Have you had that experience? Yeah, you and I have used that one, the toxies bind, when that one yep. with the fulvic acid is not done, yep. have as much clay or anything. That one tends to move the bowels pretty good. It may even have a bowel moving effect to it in reality. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it doesn't, I don't think it binds up as much on the nutrient side. A lot of these binders, you definitely want to take more away from food because they can bind up a lot of the supplements or nutrition in the food where I think humic acid is not going to be as competing for nutrients as well. Yeah. Good call. I have seen that it's where there'll be discussion like, Hey, you can take it with or without food. I still yep. think empty stomach is better though, especially first thing in the morning or even in I the middle so of the night because yep. you're fasted. And when you're fasting, that's been proven to excrete more mycotoxins. So if you wake up first thing in the morning, you've been fasted for 12, 14 hours. To me, that's a great time to take a binder. Totally. And if you're binding things up and there's something there and you're binding up a nutrient where you could be binding up a mold toxin, well, you're, you're kind of just, you're losing kind of your bang for your buck on these binders. So you want it to have the, um, the greatest ability to bind to as much of the toxic debris that's present, not other nutritive substances. So we got to keep an eye on that. And then next we talked about uh, probiotics. We already hit that, right? That's going to have a major effect on binding with many different molds, whether it's aflatoxin, gliotoxin, strigomatocystin, uh, uh, the trichothecenes, the xeralanone, the enitatin B, and then the citronin. These are different mold uh, toxins that we already hit on in the beginning. I'm just going to re-summarize that again for y'all, but probiotics tend to have the best bang for your buck. That's why working on fixing your gut, even if you don't have mold issues, is going to make you more prone to mold toxicity in the future. Having good motility, good healthy gut bacteria balance, good digestion really is the foundation for healthy mold detoxification and excretion. That's amazing, isn't it? Because you and I've gone mm -hmm. and, and I totally appreciate you being on board with me to go down some of these mold rabbit holes together ever since you and I became educated on this. And oh, totally. we kind of went in some, I don't want to say tangents, but we've dove into glutathione and phosphatidylcholine and cell membranes and all these other things. But now here we are again, circling right back to the foundation of just improving the gut function. And that's just amazing. Absolutely. I totally agree. So anyone listening, if you guys enjoy this or you want to dive kind of a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole of mold detoxification and, or of course, dealing with the gut because that's a major foundation for it. Um, feel free to click down below. We're going to have links to Evan's site, evanbrand.com, or you can reach out to Evan. Also my site, justinhealth.com, where you can reach out to myself, Dr. J. We're here to help you worldwide via Skype, um, FaceTime, all the different um, video mediums, as well as phone. We're excited to work with y'all. We have uh, colleagues as well that we work with to help kind of get people in the right direction. Uh, outside of that, Evan, anything else you want to highlight? 
No, that's it. We'll put some links below so you can check out some of the products. We do have some professional probiotics that we use clinically that we give to our clients. So these are things that you can access to just as a listener of the show, and that'll support the show. But more importantly, it'll help you to get this stuff out of your body. So take care. And if you have questions, concerns, please reach out. We're here for you. Thanks, y'all. We'll put our links below for the products and labs and supplements that we like and use the most in our practice. Thanks, guys. Have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Take care. Bye.